All right, shall we just say a word of prayer before we go to the word of the Lord? Father, we thank you for your presence with us today. Thank you because we have so many beautiful promises and things that we can hold on to because we know that you're working in our life. And now as we look into your word in the book of Esther, we pray, Lord, that you would speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. So today we're starting a series on the book of Esther. It's going to be a five-part series, and so we're just going to walk along through this book to see a few different truths um, in, in the Word of God. And uh, how many here have read the book of Esther before? Okay, so most of you know the story of the book of Esther. We read chapter 2, but in this book, as we journey through this book, what I'd like us to be able to see is how God uses imperfect people to fulfill his perfect plan. And that's such a beautiful thing, that because how many know that we are all imperfect people, but he can use our imperfections to fulfill his perfect plan. And this story of Esther is such a beautiful story because it's filled with intrigue, anticipation, suspense, action, courage, celebration. And as you read through the book and as you ask the Lord to speak to you, Let's learn some of the eternal and timeless truths in the Word of God. We can see these timeless themes that we see all throughout the Word of God found in the book of Esther. Themes like redemption, salvation, protection, love, mercy, judgment, victory. These are just some of the beautiful themes that we can see in this ancient story of God's providence. Uh, Today we're going to see... Uh, this aspect of the lure of the world. We'll also see throughout this series the fight between good and evil, the boldness of a queen, the triumph of the sovereign God who reigns over the affairs of men. Now, this story takes place during the 5th century BC during the reign of King Assasuerus or King Xerxes I, who was a king over Persia. And the setting of this story is in the palace uh, at Susa. And so let me just give you a quick summary of what happens in chapter 1 and chapter 2. We read chapter 2, but just a quick summary of what happens in chapter 1 and chapter 2. So chapter 1, the king gives this big, huge, grand feast or banquet that lasted 180 days or six months. How would you like that? Would you like to go to a feast? Then you just go to a feast for six months. All you're doing is eating, eating, and more eating. Okay, six months worth of of feasting. And this was to display his wealth and his splendor and his glory. And after that banquet, then he gave another banquet that lasted for seven days. Actually, we probably won't look too much in detail throughout this book, but if you wanted to study something else about the book of Esther, is all the banquets that are throughout this book. You'll, You'll see so many different banquets that take place throughout the book of Esther, but that's a study for another time. In chapter 1, we read of the king's extravagance and his riches, and he wanted to be uh, seen or portrayed as a great man. And uh, also in chapter 1, we see another banquet, which was the banquet that Queen Vashti gave for all the women. And so the king, he called uh, Queen Vashti to come to the banquet that the king was holding because he wanted to show her beauty off to everyone. And uh, she decided not to come. And this was a great offense to the king and, in fact, to all the men. And so Vashti was removed from being queen. And so the king needed to find a new queen. So he commanded, a command went out for all, as we read in chapter 2, for all the beautiful young women to come into the harem, into the citadel at Susa. And one woman who would please the king would be chosen to be queen. Um, Some people think that maybe there would have been a, a thousand women brought into the harem at this time. And one of the women that was brought in was Esther, who was a Jew, and she was an orphan that was brought up by her cousin Mordecai. And the Bible says that Esther had a lovely figure and was beautiful. And she was put in the care of a man named Haggai, which was the king's eunuch, or the man that would take care of all of the, the, the concubines or the, the women that the king had. And the Bible says that Esther found favor in his eyes. And uh, She was moved by Haggai Haggai to the very best place in the harem and given special food and given beauty treatments, as we read. And she was commanded by Mordecai to keep her nationality secret. She was not to tell anybody that she was a Jew. And in preparation for the one night that she had with the king, uh, all she asked for was whatever Haggai, the eunuch, had recommended. 
And she spent her one night with the king, and the king was pleased with her and attracted to her, and she won the king's favor and approval. And so she was made queen and gave another banquet, and another banquet was given, okay, in chapter 2, and that was called Esther's Banquet, which we read about. So just in chapters 1 and 2, we've actually, there's actually four banquets. First is the king's banquet, then is the the, the queen's banquet, then there was another banquet actually for seven days after the king's banquet, and then at the end we see Esther's banquet, right, when she becomes king, right, and that takes us to chapter 2 and verse 18. So um, in this story we see that the Jews, they were living in a society that did not share their values and their beliefs and their morals. I think that was one of the reasons why Mordecai told Esther, keep your nationality a secret. And in a similar way, I believe we're living in such a society today that does not share our values and our beliefs and our morals according to what we learn from the Word of God. It's quite distinct from what the Bible teaches. So the question is, how are we to live in such an environment? Are we to be set apart like monks and not get involved at all with what's happening in the world? Are we to compromise and do everything that the world is saying to do? Or are we to stand in opposition to everything? Or do we shine as a light in dark situations? Um, how can we live in this world whose culture, values, and morals don't align with what Scripture teaches us? You know, there's one really unique thing in this book of Esther is that the name of God is not mentioned one time, right? Right? Some people wanted to kick the book of Esther out of the canon because the name of God is not even mentioned at all in this book. But the beautiful thing, as the subtitle says here, is that you can see the fingerprints of God all over the book of Esther, right? Even though his name is not mentioned there. And I think the, beauty that, the, the beautiful thing that it speaks to us about is that when it seems like God is not in our life, when it seems like God is not working or God is not answering prayer or God is not manifesting himself, don't lose hope because the sovereign God is still working. His fingerprints are there. So I think the name of God is not mentioned in this book to teach us a beautiful truth that even though he's not outwardly evident, he's still at work watching over his people. Even though he's not outwardly evident, he's still at work watching over his people. You know, it's very interesting because there's various passages in the Bible where you see when there's a problem, when you see a crisis, when you see a difficult situation, you see God working in an amazing way. For example, you see Elijah calling down fire from heaven to prove that, you know, uh, that the God of Israel is the true God. Uh, in the book of Daniel, we see a person walking in the midst of the fire with Daniel's uh, friends, the three Hebrew boys, and God delivers them. God sends ten plagues to bring Israel out of Egypt, right? Jesus does signs and wonders to prove his divinity. But let me ask you a question. How many of us here, in your day-to-day -day life, you experience some of these things? Anyone here? Have you experienced something like this? Elijah calling fire from heaven down? Anyone can do that here? Have you experienced some of these things like in the book of Daniel, these three Hebrew boys in a fiery furnace and, a, and another person walking with them? Have you seen, have you had an experience where you see like God sending 10 plagues down upon Egypt? In a lot of the stories in the Bible, we see the supernatural God working in supernatural ways, but it is very, very difficult for us to relate to those type of stories because we live a very mundane and ordinary life, and we hear these amazing stories of God working in amazing ways and wonderful ways and supernatural ways, and we look at our life and we think, where is God? Because I see the God of the Bible, but I don't see how he is in my life today in that same way. And I think that's what is the beauty of the book of Esther, because you, you can contrast the ways you see God working in all these other books of the Bible, and you see the way that God works in, in the book of Esther, and you see how God uses people to enact his beautiful plan. You don't see something supernatural happening here in the book of Esther. You don't see something like Elijah calling down fire from heaven. You don't see this great miracle, but you do see great things happening as God moves people and as God uses people 
to bring deliverance to the nation of Israel. And so it's such a beautiful thing that we see that even though God's name is not mentioned, we see not by a supernatural work, but by God using people who are bold enough to take a step of faith and fulfill the word of God. We see a string of coincidences in this book that are really not coincidences, but it is God that is working. It's interesting because at one point, if you know, I'm I'm just going to go a little bit ahead, but... It's interesting because at one point in the story, you see a a time when the king can't sleep and he reads a scroll. And in that scroll, it's a remembrance of an act that Mordecai actually did. And then now the king wants to honor Mordecai because he's forgotten about it. And at that particular time, Haman, who's the enemy, is right in the court at that time. It's not a coincidence that all of these things are happening right at the perfect time. And if you've read through the book of Esther, then you know what I'm talking about. But if not, we'll get to that later on in the series. But the question is, what are the coincidences in your life that when they happen, they seem to be insignificant? And sometimes we even overlook it in our life. But later on, we can look back and we can see how God moved and how God worked and how God fulfilled his will. So I'll give you the main theme. This is what I believe is the main theme in the book of Esther, and we'll see this time and again as we go through this book. A sovereign God working providentially through the actions, circumstances, and decisions of humanity, both good and evil, to fulfill his divine plan and purposes. I'll say that again. It's up here on the the screen. A sovereign God working providentially through the actions, circumstances, and decisions of humanity, both good and evil, to fulfill his divine plan and purposes. And one of those main purposes is to protect his people and to fulfill his word and his promises to the children of Israel. So we'll come back to this a little bit later on in uh, in the series. So There are times that we see instead of God working miracles, instead of God doing something supernatural, he works through the mundane. And I think many times that's much more relatable to our lives, right? There are times in the Bible when we see God doing supernatural things. We see God doing amazing things, but then we scratch our heads and wonder, well, God, how come you're not doing that for me? And I think the beauty of the book of Esther is to be able to see the hand of God in the mundane, the hand of God in the very natural unmiraculous, normal way. And that gives us such confidence and assurance that God is still working, God is still fighting for us. He's everywhere. He's in every decision. He's in every circumstance. God is never absent. God is always working behind the scenes. And many times we want God to do the miraculous. But here's the question. Can we trust him in the mundane? Can we trust him in the ordinary? So um, in chapter 1, there was this great feast there was this beauty pageant in chapter 2. And what I'd like to look at here in, in the life of Esther to learn some truths today is to see the actions of Esther and Mordecai. Now, I'm going to tell you a few things here. And your first gut reaction is going to, you're probably going to be like, huh, Daniel, no, no, no. Because if you've read the book of Esther and if you've heard any messages about the book of Esther, Esther is who? This amazing woman. Esther is this awesome person that God used to save his people. But we'll get to the amazingness of Esther later on. We will get to the awesomeness of Esther, so please don't misunderstand me. But I want to reflect to you something a little bit different. Now, this is not Daniel making this up. I've read commentaries about this and studied this and everything, so it's not something totally new or anything. Okay? But it might be just because normally when we study the book of Esther, Esther is all the way up here from beginning to the end. But what I'd like us to see is Esther down here and then Esther coming up here. Because in our lives, we're not always up here. And many times, we are down here. And I really believe to make Esther more relatable to us and understandable to us is to see her in her weakness and frailty and to see how God uses that still to accomplish this amazing purpose through her life. And us, in our weakness and in our frailty, God can still use to accomplish something amazing. So Esther was taken into the, into the harem. Now, when the women were taken into the harem, there were basically four outcomes that could have happened. Number one, if the king didn't like her, 
If the king didn't like her, then she would become a concubine for the rest of her life, and she could not get married again. The king would not see her ever again. She was basically condemned to perpetual widowhood. This was the worst possible outcome for Esther, right? If the king didn't like her, she would be a concubine, kept in his harem. He would never see her again, and that's it. She couldn't get married. She couldn't leave. She was condemned to perpetual widowhood for the rest of her life, and she couldn't get married to anyone else. If the king liked her, then she would be kept as a concubine, and every now and then the king would call her, right? And the king would sleep with her. If the king really, that was number two. Number three, if the king really liked her, then she would become one of his very few wives, and any children that he would have with her would be part of the royal line and the royal lineage. That was option three. The fourth option, which was the most rarest option and the smallest percentage, was that if the king delighted in her, she would become the principal wife and become the queen over the whole land. And that's what happened to Esther. But any one of those other three options could have happened to Esther as well, right? But the story is written here, and we can read it because the best option happened to her. So the title of this message is The Lure of the World. And in these two chapters, what we really see here is what the world has to offer. It's very interesting because in chapters 1 and 2, everything that's flaunted, everything that's talked about, everything that's emphasized is the outward experience. When, we look at, uh, when, when Samuel went looking for a king to anoint over Israel, he went to David's house and he saw David's older brother. And what did Samuel think? He thought, look at that man, nice and strong and nice and big. He must be the next king. And what did God say to, to Samuel? In 1 Samuel 16, verse 7, it says, The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Even the great prophet Samuel got it wrong because he was looking at the outward appearance. And many times we get it wrong as well because we concentrate so much on the outward things and we don't look at the things that really matter, which is on the inside. And in the book of Esther in chapters 1 and 2, all we see is this flaunting of wealth, this flaunting of prosperity, abundance of wine, abundance of gold, abundance of women, abundance of all of these things. And it's all about the exterior and it's all the lure of the world to draw us and attract us to things that in the end and eternity don't really count. We see the way that the world was in the outward appearance. The king, the king wanted to flaunt his wealth, and so by do, he did that by putting on a feast for six months. Have you ever heard of a feast for six months? Imagine how much money and food and everything that you needed to, to do something like that. He was flaunting his wealth. He brought out his riches, his gold, his silver, his pearls, to show that he was a big man. People could drink without restriction. They were allowed to have as, as much wine as they wanted. And he wanted to flaunt the, the beauty of his wife, and that's why he brought Queen Vashti out. It wasn't about her character or inner beauty. He wanted to show off her exterior beauty to the people. And the search for the new queen was based on what? Let's find the most noble character, the most you know, honorable girl. No, it was totally based on outward beauty. And even when they came into the harem, what did they do? Twelve months of beauty treatments. Now, maybe that sounds really nice to some people, right? But that's all. It was twelve months of beauty treatments. The, the, the whole focus on chapters one and two is on the external. It's on the lure of the world. It's what the world counts as important. And we see such a contrast to what the Word of God teaches about how God looks at the heart. You know, there was a time in the New Testament when the devil came to tempt Jesus and after uh, all these other temptations didn't work, the last one was what? The temptation of all the kingdoms of this world. In Matthew 4, verse 8 to 10, it says again, the devil took him to a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all the splendor. And he said, all of this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. And Jesus said, away from me, me Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And there was this attraction to the world. Now, what I'd like to see is, look at, if, you, if you look at the book of Esther in chapter 2 in this contrast, we know the story of Daniel and his, and his friends. And Daniel and his friends lived around the same time during, the, during this captivity time, right? They lived around the same time and they were also brought into captivity and things like that. 
And if you see the story of Daniel, and if you see the story of Esther and Mordecai, both of these two stories contrast each other. Why? Because Daniel and his friends told everybody, we are Jews, we are not going to bow down to this idol. We are Jews, we're not even going to eat of the food that is given to us. And we are willing to pay with our lives. This was the stand of, of Daniel and his friends. Daniel was willing to go to the lion's den to face death by lions. Daniel's friends, the three Hebrew boys, they were willing to be thrown into the fire and to die because they didn't want to worship that idol. Daniel 3 and verse 17 and 18 says, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, this is the, the, Daniel's friends, they're saying this, they said, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you set up. Can you see that Daniel and his friends, they were willing to go to the point of death because they did not want to worship the idols. They did not want to eat the food from the king's table. They did not want to defile themselves. But what does Esther do? She sleeps with a man out of wedlock, then marries a man who's not an Israelite and an unbeliever. Could it get any worse? Now, I, I do want to concede the point that during that time, Esther might not have had a choice. When they went and rounded up all of these women and brought them to the harem, Esther probably didn't have a choice to say, yes, I'm coming, or no, I'm not going to come. Daniel and his friends, of course, they made a decision to say, I'm, we're not going to do any of these things. And so maybe Esther didn't have a choice. But even if that was the case, a few chapters later, when Mordecai tells Esther of what has happened, and how there's going to be a holocaust happening, and all of these Israelites are going to die, he tells Esther, go and intercede for the king, to the king. And Esther says, I can't go and intercede, because the king hasn't called me. And if I go, I might die. And Mordecai says, you better do what you're supposed to do, because maybe you've come into the kingdom for such a time as this. And so Esther, and this is happening in chapter 4, and we're going to get to that. Here is my, here is my contention. In Esther chapter 4, Esther is willing to go in front of the king and Esther is willing to intercede for her people and say, if I die, I die. If I perish, I perish. But when it comes to chapter 2, Esther is not saying anything like that. When it comes to chapter 2, Esther is not saying, no, 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 I don't want all of these beauty treatments. I don't want any of these things. I don't want any of, any of the things that the world has to offer because I don't want to defile myself because I'm a Jew. And I think the blame can't be put on Esther completely. I think Mordecai as well, being her, her, her guardian, didn't protect Esther from that. But in chapter 4, she's willing to die. Why is it not in chapter 2 that she's willing to die? Daniel and his friends, they were willing to die because they didn't want to defile themselves. And we see here, again, now, please forgive me because sometimes, again, we hold Esther very highly up and, and definitely we will see Esther being amazing and wonderful later on. But what I want to illustrate to you is the frailty of humanity, which we all have, and how God can still use that for his beautiful purposes. And I think here, Mordecai and Esther make a really crucial mistake by allowing all of this stuff to happen and not taking a stand like Daniel and his friends to say, no, I'm not going to participate with the way the world is working. But I think maybe the lure of the world was very attractive. Maybe the option to be the wife of the king was very attractive. Maybe all those beauty treatments, you know, at those spas, you know, you can get a good group on, you know. Maybe some of them, I'm not saying anything wrong with that, you know, go for it. But I'm just saying that in, in this story, maybe some of those things was very attractive. Maybe what the world, what, what, what the, the kingdom of Persia was offering was very attractive. For Daniel and his friends, they said, no, we can't do that. Not even to eat food from the king's table. It says Daniel purposed in himself that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat. But here, Esther, we see a different story. Again, we're going to see Esther doing some amazing things later on. And that's the beauty of the story. 
how God takes our faults and failures and our frailty and the ways that we compromise and we might mess up and we might make wrong decisions and I think Mordecai has a lot of blame on this as well as, as Esther's guardian and he should have spoken up and said something and done something to prevent all of these things you know, from happening. But even when we make mistakes, God can still turn it around and do something beautiful and amazing and good. Timothy Keller asked the question, are you a concubine to the world system? Have you sold yourself to the culture of the world? So many times we do that. So many times we compromise. First John chapter 2, verses 15 and 17, it says, Do not love the world or anything of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes, from the Father, uh, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God, abides forever. Dear people of God, friends, what are our priorities in life? How do we make decisions in life? How do we choose where we live? How do we choose what job we take? How do we choose who to marry? How do we choose how we live? How is that defined? Is that defined by the systems and ways and cultures of the world? Or is that defined by the standards and convictions that we receive from the Word of God, from Scripture? Are we attracted to the lure of the world, or are we able to take a stand for what Scripture says? And that's how we make decisions. So many times, our identity is based on how much we have, what we look like, what type of job we have, how much wealth we possess, who we know, and who knows us, how far we can ascend up the corporate ladder, how famous we are, how well-known we are. So many times our identity is based on those things when actually our identity should be based on our relationship with Christ. Throughout the scriptures in the the Sermon on the Mount, in the Gospels, in the letters that the apostles wrote, the character of those in the kingdom of God are clearly spelled out. But are we like the king, like King Xerxes, desiring to show off to others our status, our wealth, our position? Do we seek the affirmation of others at all costs? And are we willing to compromise like Mordecai and Esther in this story to obtain that affirmation? What are we compromising? Luke 16 says, verse 14 and 15, it says, the Pharisees who love money heard all of this and were sneering at Jesus. He said to them, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others, but God knows your hearts because what people value highly is what? Detestable in God's sight. The things that the world holds up very highly and very important is actually detestable in the sight of God. In Esther chapter 2 and verse 9, it says, She pleased him and won his favor. Immediately he provided her with her beauty treatments and special food. He assigned to her seven female attendants, selected from the king's palace, and moved her and her attendants to the very best place in the harem. You know, nowadays we fight against things like this. We fight against sexual exploitation. We fight against human trafficking. We fight against those things. But many times we read the story of Esther and from the beginning till the end we think this is an amazing story and we lift Esther so highly up, but she's actually being taken advantage of here. And it's a sad situation. In chapter chapter 2 and verse 15 it says, when the turn came for Esther, the young woman Mordecai had adopted, the daughter of his uncle Abihail, to go into the king, she asked for nothing other than what Haggai, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the harem, suggested. She was just completely sold off to, I'm going to do whatever you want me to do. In James chapter 4 and verse 4, it says, you know, this verse, the adulterous people. Don't you know that the friendship of the world means what? Enmity against God. Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Now, again, Esther might not have had a choice at that time, at that culture, Uh, Women didn't have much of a say, and maybe rounding up all of these women into the harem, Esther might not have had a choice, so I I put maybe some of the blame on Mordecai as well. But again, I want to contrast the story with the book of Daniel as well, and to say that Daniel and his friends, they were willing to go to death to stand up for what they thought was right. And Esther is willing to go 
to pay the ultimate price of death a couple chapters later. In chapter 4, Esther says, if I perish, I perish. And so we see a little bit of growth here in Esther. We see in chapter 4, she's willing to make that decision. But in chapter 2, she's not willing. In chapter 2, she's just ready to do whatever they're asking, her, asking of her. Many times we're guilty in that sense. We compromise. We spend the one night with the king. We compromise our convictions instead of standing for what the word of God says. But you know the beautiful part of the story? Is that there's hope. There's redemption. There's deliverance all throughout this book. That's the amazing part of the story. That in, in our frailties and in our human failure and in the times we compromise with the world and the times we mess up and in the times that we don't do the will of God and in the times that we just make wrong decisions and we just, everything looks like it's just going in the wrong way and according to the ways of the world, still God who is sovereign, God whose fingerprints are upon our lives, still the God who is working in our lives, who's blessing us and is changing us and transforming us is you using even the bad circumstances for good to accomplish his beautiful plan and purpose in our lives. And that's why I said this theme that you see throughout the book of Esther is how God providentially and sovereignly works in our lives to bring about his purposes in the good and in the bad. And how he works to protect his people. So dear people of God, no matter what bad decisions we have made in the past, no matter how bad we have failed in the past, no matter how much we've compromised ourselves in the past, no matter how much we've sold ourselves to do evil in the past, remember that one of the greatest themes in the Bible, and it's so beautifully illustrated in the life of Esther and in this book, is that there is redemption for us because of what Jesus has done on Calvary. And that is the hope that we have, that we can always run to the cross. Romans 8 verse 28 says, and we know that all things God works, that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And I don't think we could see this more true or more clearly in the story of Esther. How in great failure and in messing up, And in compromising, still God works everything together for good because God uses Esther's position in the palace to bring about salvation for all the children of Israel. God uses messed up people like you and me. God uses failures like you and me. And one thing we have to know is that God is in control and that he is protecting his people even when he is not obviously doing it. That's the beauty of the book of Esther. It's not Elijah calling down fire from heaven and everyone saying that's the living and true God and we know God's people and we know the the people of the world. It's not one of those big supernatural things, but it is God, the fingerprints of God all over the story of Esther that God is protecting his people even when we think he is not obviously doing it. He is working behind the scenes. And even in our lives, dear people of God, if you cannot see the obvious hand of God, if you cannot see the supernatural work of God, if you cannot see the fire coming down from heaven or the ten plagues killing off your enemies or this thing or that thing that we read of amazing stories in the Bible, even if you don't see the healing of the blind man or the raising of the dead man, even if you don't see these supernatural things, realize that the sovereign God is working behind the scenes and his fingerprints are all over there and he's working all things together for good to save his people to redeem his people to protect his people he is working on our behalf for our good to bring us into eternity to enjoy his presence forever and ever and that is the story of the bible that is the story of esther and we see it so beautifully and wonderfully illustrated in our failure he still works can i get one amen Amen. thank you because that's the beauty of this story so three lessons quickly and i'll close number one When the values of this world clash with the values of the kingdom of God, it's more important to obey God. When the values of this world clash with the values of the kingdom of God, it's more important to obey God. Acts 5 and verse 29, when they were persecuting the apostles, Peter said, Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than man. We will come to decisions, hard decisions in our life as we go through this life. And it's getting harder as the days go by. Culture is shifting in such a tremendous and exponential fashion, contrary to the standards of the Word of God. 
And we will come to places where we have to make hard decisions. We will come to places where we have to make sacrifices. We'll, have, we'll come to places where even our job might be on the line. And here is the lesson we learn from the book of Esther, that when the values of the world clash with the values of the kingdom of God, it is better and more important to obey God. To obey God when that happens. Number two, Jesus gave up everything for us, and his life of self-sacrifice exemplifies true beauty. We see in chapters 1 and 2 what the world calls beauty. We see in chapter 1 and 2 what the world extols, and that's the feast, that's the gold, that's the silver, that's these a beautiful young women, these, you know, bringing into the, in the harem. We see all of these things, and this is what the world extols. But we see through the life of Jesus what true beauty actually is. And true beauty is what? A life of self-sacrifice. And we'll see that going forward when we get to Esther chapter 4 and we see Esther saying, on the outside, Esther was a beautiful girl. We read that. But the true beauty of Esther comes out when? In chapter 4. When Esther says, if I perish, I perish. But I'll, I'll intercede for my people. And that's the true beauty of the character of Esther. And we see that beautifully in the life of Jesus. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 2 says, Walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and as a sacrifice to God. Right? Number three, the last one. Until we realize what true beauty is, we will be sold out to the ways of the world. Until we realize what true beauty is, We'll see that as we go through this book of Esther until we realize that we will be sold out to the ways of the world. We'll be living in chapters 1 and 2. We'll be, the things that happen in chapters 1 and 2 will be the most important to us. The feasts, the gold, the silver, the beauty treatments, all of these different things, the exter- externalities that we see in chapters 1 and 2 will be the most important. And that's why in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for me will, will find it. Until we realize what true beauty is, until we realize that true beauty in self-sacrifice will be sold out to the things of the world. That's what will be our priority. So my challenge to all of us, including myself today, is what is true beauty? Is it that life of self-sacrifice that God calls us to live? Whoever wants to be my disciples should take up, deny themselves, take up their cross end, and follow me. Whoever loses his life for my name will find it. I'll close with the story of, of a lady named Esther as well. Her name was actually Esther Ann Kim. In 1939, the Japanese were forcing people to bow down to the shrine of their sun god. And the punishment for, for not doing so was imprisonment, torture, and possibly death. Many Christians decided that they could outwardly bow down to this idol as long as inwardly in their hearts they worshiped Jesus. Many Christians had decided that. But Esther Ann Kim, I like how her name is Esther. It was really good with the story here. But Esther, she knew that she could not make such a compromise she decided that she could not live her, her, uh, her life for herself. And she declared, Today on the mountain, before the large crowd, I will proclaim that there is no God but you. That was her prayer to the Lord. So when her group reached the shrine, it was at a mountain called Nassam Mountain in Seoul, Korea. Everyone bowed except Esther. Her uncertainty and fear vanished, and a calmness and peace filled her. And she told the Lord, I died today on that mountain. Now it's only you who lives through me. I leave everything in your hands. And she lived for some time in hiding, but she knew that in a matter of time she would be caught and imprisoned. So you know what Esther did? She knew that she would be imprisoned for what she did, so she started to prepare herself for imprisonment. How? By fasting, because she knew she wouldn't get food all the time. By memorizing scripture. She memorized more than 100 chapters in the Bible and many hymns because she knew that when she'd be in prison, she could remember those, those passages. 
She started to pray. She started to train uh, to endure harsh conditions. So she slept without a quilt. She lived in deep poverty. She even ate rotten produce just to prepare herself for prison that she knew would eventually come. And Esther felt God calling her to come out of hiding and to boldly proclaim the truth of the gospel to the Japanese people. And she knew that this would lead to her death. So she spent six years in prison, but displayed amazing love to her persecutors and fellow prisoners. She endured harsh torture and refused to deny the name of Christ. Many came to know Christ through her example. One time in prison, she gave up her meager, food, her meager prison food for several days to a woman who was filthy, insane, and sentenced to death for murdering her husband. Instead of being repulsed by the woman, as all the other prisoners were, Esther prayed relentlessly for her, sacrificing her own comforts to reach the woman's heart. The woman died in her right mind, knowing Christ with a hope. After she was released, her story of her imprisonment and unwavering faith became an all-time bestseller in Korea, inspiring thousands of people to stand strong for their faith. And so the question that we need to ask ourselves today is, are we dying to ourselves daily like Esther did? Are we more concerned with protecting our own comforts and our own interests rather than giving our lives to Jesus in full surrender. If you want to read her biography, it's called I, If I Perish, the story of Esther Ann Kim. If I Perish, taken again from chapter 4 of the book of Esther, when Esther says, if I perish, I perish. Dear friends, dear, dear people of God, I don't know what your situation is today, and maybe you can relate to Esther in the Bible because of some of the things that she went through, but I want to encourage you, don't lose hope. We're going we're gonna to sing this song called uh, Sovereign, and the verses to the song talk about how God is working and accomplishing his purposes and his plans in our life. In the good and in the bad, he is still working. It's the beauty of this story of Esther. He's with us in the calm. He's with us in the storm. He's with us in the dawn. And he's with us in the dark. And we know that God is working in all of these situations. So shall we all stand?